Yep. Roger, hi, it's good to see you. As brilliant director of St. Austin, you've been here now for close to 20 years and have seen a phenomenal number of changes. I mean, could you perhaps describe what's taken place? That yeah, I mean, it's been a huge change. I, I joined this uh, business in, in 1999, and at that time we were you know, one of uh, maybe 30 or 35 family breweries across the UK, um, all of them very much concentrating on cask condition beer with uh, tight estates of pubs and selling their beer very locally. Um, Coming into this brewery, we had a real vision. We could see the opportunity. We could see the. Um, we have great provenance located down here in the southwest of England in Cornwall. Um, so we've got great local provenance. Uh, we've got a great brewery, and we've got a great story to tell. So the opportunity to grow and develop our brand from our region was was, was there, and that's really been our strategy over the course of the last 19 years. In terms of. Uh Beer technology, though, you've also been, while a traditional brewer, very much modernizing the way that you go about brewing the beer and processing the beer, which brings us to beer membrane filtration. Yeah. You're one of the first in the world to make use, especially of this smaller unit that Pantera now has on the market. Mm. What led you to uh, making the decision to install? You know product? what, something I've been watching for quite some time. Um, you know, membrane filtration has been established in other industries and certainly in wine and cider. So down here in the southwest of England, the cider industry is fairly well established and, uh, you know, vi visiting cider makers and seeing membrane filtration in place. You know, the question was always there, why is this being used with cider? Why isn't it being used with beer? Um, and then certainly this sort of early, early entry of, of membrane filtration into the beer market was on the, uh, the very large scale breweries. And it's only really in the last year or two that we've now started to see membrane filtration become accessible for uh, intermediate sized breweries such as ourselves. So I think we've been kind of keeping a watching brief on it for quite a while. Uh, but as soon as we saw that this became a viable option for us, it was something that we were very keen to pursue. Beer membrane filtration offers a number of advantages. I mean, I would think that. Certainly environmental concerns to be part of it. You've, you've, yeah, I'm absolutely. presuming you were using Kieselgur previously? Yeah, we were on a Kieselgur. We had a, a, a vertical leaf uh, D filter. So, I mean, really the, the, the advantages are threefold. I mean, you know, um, beer quality and uh, just the consistency of beer quality and the control of beer quality. Uh, it is about uh, health and safety. I mean, powder is not nice stuff, as we know, and just handling powder, the mess associated with powder and the environmental impact of disposing of powder, so the desire to move away from powder filtration. Um, and finally, of course, um, yeah, it's got stack up financially, so it's a return on investment, and actually is this going to uh, be revenue earning for us as a business. In terms of beer quality, have you seen a substantial difference in what the final product looks like? Yeah, we, we, we have, and actually where we've really noticed it is on the shelf life. Um, mm. Not so much actually when the beer is fresh and bottled, but we've seen on our sort of three month and 12 month uh, tastings of our bottles, we've really seen greater stability in the shelf life. And we put that down to a number of things. I mean, of course, dissolved oxygen control uh, is critical. We could achieve good DO control with the, with the DE filter, but it was highly manual, and therefore anything that is manual has potential to be variable. So it's a little bit sort of operator and procedure dependent. So we've got greater consistency of our DO control. Um, we also think that um, actually in terms of uh, iron, so iron has always been a risk with filter powder that you get iron pickup. We're not getting that and we just think that the beer is cleaner and has a, a better stability and pack as a result of, of moving to the membrane and far more consistent. Right, excellent. You've also got a simplification in the process as well. There's no separator upstream anymore. Yeah, and, and this was a big one on the, on the return on investment, in fact, was um, uh, historically when we're using the D filtration, we had to prepare the beer with a separator which meant that we were operating a two-tank system. We were running the, uh, the energy costs of running a, a centrifuge are considerable. There's big, sure. motor, big motors on there. So, um, uh, but the big one actually was moving from a, a two-tank system to a unitank system, and everything that's associated with that, including things like CIP, cleaning, time. Um, big one's actually CO2 consumption, very topical at the moment with uh, some of the CO2 issues. But actually, you know, we're using CO2 gas to displace tanks uh, on transfer, and actually we've seen a, a knockdown on the amount of CO2 that we're using as well. So, you know, big savings around moving from a, a, a two-tank system to a unitank system, and that, that was really was one of the attractions for us. Roger, one of the interesting things about the arrangement with Pantera is that you have the membranes, uh, are, are they're being leased, which I'm assuming has a couple of benefits in terms of securing costs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, leasing the membranes, uh, 
was extremely helpful from our return on investment uh, determination for the project. And, um, you know, we are entering into new technology. So uh, the leasing just, you know, the membranes have life for about two years, but uh, by leasing it just takes the risk out and it gives us a known cost. So um, it just means that we can be more specific about understanding where the savings are going to come from. To sum up then, you'd highly recommend beer membrane filtration? Well, we, we bought one and then we bought a second one. So um, <laughs> so I think that uh, we recommended it to ourselves. So, um, yeah, yeah so uh, um, it's, I've believed for a number of years that membrane filtration is the way forward. And when the opportunity came uh, for a, a smaller scale, scale unit for, for our size of operation, uh, strongly, I believe that that was the way forward. And I think that has proven to be the case. Good, okay. You have a, a long-standing relationship with Pentair. You've worked with them for a number of years, I believe, starting with their their valve system. Is that right? Yeah, we've we, we've got lots of uh, Pentair Submo valves uh, around the site here. Um, I think the first ones were probably back in 2006, something like that. So, uh, yeah, well, it's pretty much our standard uh, standard valve across the site here at St. Hostel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What are they like to work with? <laughs> You'll have to ask our engineers about that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, ge genuinely, they are, you know, the, 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 the valves are good, good solid valves. They require minimum maintenance, but uh, certainly from, in terms of spares and support, we've, uh, you know, been uh, thoroughly backed up and supported by Pentair. So, uh, so well, well, there's the thing. In terms of working with Pentair, what's yeah. the relationship been like? Are they a good company to work with? Would it land it? Well, uh, let's, ju le let's just put it this way. Um, you know, if we bought our first uh, Submo valve back in 2006 and we're, we're buying uh, crossflow filters now and uh, continue to have conversations with Pentair. I think that probably uh, answers your question. Um, you know, it's been a, an established what, what, relationship. Which what does bring up the question as to what happens next? I mean, CO2 recovery is a possibility here, perhaps more so now with the, yeah. the recent shortages here in the UK. I think one of the things, you know, uh, uh, located where we are down here on a peninsula, uh, stuck out in the Atlantic Ocean, um, we're definitely on the periphery of the CO distribution network. So uh, clearly the recent issues did impact upon us quite, quite significantly. But um, we have seen this in the past that, you know, with, with CO2 supply, that when supplies are tight, it tends to be the more peripheral regions that suffer first. Sure. So certainly in terms of CO2 recovery, that's been something that we have been talking about for a number of years. And um, I think the recent issues have only served to escalate that in, in the priority uh, for us. So it's on the to-do list then? It's on the to-do list. It's part of, a, a part of a bigger project. So we are looking at our... Um, our fermentation facilities. Uh, we still produce our cask ale in a, in a very traditional way in square fermenters. Uh, we use conicals elsewhere for, for our bottled and, and keg beers and our lagers, but our traditional cask ales we still produce in uh, traditional square fermenters. And there are sort of questions about um, the longevity of, of, that, of that process. So we're looking at our whole fermentation block, um, right. whether we're going to put conicals in to replace the, uh, the squares. And uh, coupled to that would be CO2 recovery because the opportunity, you, you just do the mass balance on the amount of, and essentially green CO2 that we're producing from the brewery, um, the amount of uh, CO2 that we produce from fermentation and the amount that we consume on our packaging lines. And, you know, the mass balance on the face of it would appear to add up. So you think, what, why would you not want to look at this if it's a viable option? Sure, I suppose it's a matter of, well, the tank's going to have to come first in this. Instance. The tank's, of course, are going to have to come first, but it's, it's all part of, a, part of a, a bigger project. And I think, again, one of the really interesting things here, like, uh, like uh, membrane filtration, is that these technologies exist, they've been there for some time, um, however, have been largely um, scaled to the larger and macro breweries. So it's only in the recent years, and I guess with the growth of the craft beer, if, if you like, and sure. uh, the growth of, of smaller and in, intermediate-sized breweries, that this technology is now starting to become available to the more intermediate-sized operations, such as ourselves. So um, I think that's been a significant change in terms of the, the suppliers of this, of this kind of equipment, that it's now getting scaled to a level that actually becomes a viable option for a brewery such as ourselves. Great. Thanks, Roger. Yes. Good to see you. Thank you. I think we need a few more takes of that. <laughs>